things look better four years after the revolution of dignity than they did four years after the Orange Revolution. In other words, 2018, do we still see better prospects for reform ongoing than we did in 2008? So what has been achieved uh, and how? Um, how do we keep that reform momentum going through uh, the next election cycle in 2019? Are the prospects good or bad or dependent on uh, actions both internal and external? Uh, in particular, um, are reform forces, or at least self-described uh, reform forces, well enough organised to take advantage of the opportunities presented by that election? They don't seem to have a single party at the moment, should they have one. Uh, I'd also like you to address the particular issue of corruption. Uh, how meaningful are the legal reforms, the structural reforms that have been enacted? Um, can we expect to see real progress on that particular front? Uh, uh, so we have an excellent panel. Um, first uh, will be uh, John Herbst from... Uh, I'll get my list. Sorry. John Herbst, who is uh, from the Atlantic Council, one of our sponsors, where he is director of the Dino Patricio uh, Eurasia Centre. Uh, so, John, if you could speak for 10, 15 minutes, please. Hello. Okay. Um, the title of this panel is Ukraine's Rebirth in the Face of Putin's Aggression. And I'm going to provide a, a kind of overview to this looking a little bit at the security and the political side, because you have three experts who will talk um, in great detail about reform. The, to look at this issue, you really have to go back four and a half years to the spring of 2014. At that time, the Kremlin had seized and quote unquote annexed Crimea. The Kremlin had begun its hybrid war, its hybrid war in Donbass. Uh, a war that it seemed at least in part to be winning, because while, of course, it had been failed in Dnipro and had failed in Kharkiv, it had succeeded in Donetsk and Luhansk and was moving slowly but steadily westward, having taken Slavyansk, fighting for Kramatorsk. And people watching what was happening had to ask the question, would Ukraine, in fact, survive as an independent, and fully sovereign state. Put another way, would Ukraine fight and fight effectively for real sovereignty and territorial and for its territory? Uh, I visited, I had worked in Ukraine at the US Embassy from 2003 to 2006, and I went back to Ukraine for the first time after I left as a diplomat in June of 2014. And I heard from senior officials in the Ukrainian government in June of 2014 that in April, out of the hundreds of thousands of security personnel in the military, in the border guards, in the police, in the SBU, there were five or 6,000 people who were reliable, in other words, who could be trusted, who were trained, who were equipped to carry the fight for Donbass. By the time I had that conversation, they said there were 40,000 such people. And certainly by July of 2014, it was clear that the answer to that question that was posed, would Ukraine fight and fight effectively for Donbass, had been answered in the affirmative. And Ukraine began to steadily take back territory. And by early August of 2014, it seemed that Ukraine was on the verge of taking back all of Donbass. That was despite the fact that in the period leading up to early August of 2014, the Kremlin was sending in more equipment, more quote-unquote volunteers, um, better equipment. Despite all of that, Ukraine was on the verge of taking back the entire East, at which point the Red Army went in, regular forces went in, and defeated Ukraine at Ilovaisk. That was not the end of the story, because, in effect, uh, the result of Kremlin aggression forced the West to be understand that, in fact, or at least to begin to understand, is a better way to put it, that what was happening in eastern Ukraine was not a civil war, was not so-called separatist fighting against the central government, but it was, in fact, a Russian-led, equipped, financed, 
an impartially staffed war against Ukraine, which led to sanctions. Of course, the shoot down of MH17 contributed to that. And suddenly you had in Ukraine's east a stalemate. Uh, that stalemate continues despite, fire, despite the fact that there's been a ceasefire since September of 14. That stalemate continues to this day. Ukraine has effectively fought to a stalemate the world's second largest military power. That is a significant achievement. The Kremlin designed to create a quote unquote Nova Russia that extended from Luhansk in the northeast down to Odessa and into Transnistria in the southwest failed. And at the same time as Ukraine was doing this, it had to undertake economic stabilization and major reform, which other people on this panel will talk to. But let me just cite a few things to talk about what's happened in Ukraine over the past four and a half years. In the spring of 2014, Ukraine had, I believe it was, $3 billion in reserves. There was a real expectation that the country would go into would default on its debts. Ukraine's GNP peaked in 2013. It dropped, I forget, 10 or 15 percent. Anders Aslan can provide all the details a little bit later today. Uh, it dropped further in 2015 because it was fighting a war of aggression against the world's second largest military power. Despite that, despite that, Ukraine put into, uh, put into effect a serious reform budget in early 2015. They overhauled completely the gas sector, which was absolute zero of corruption in Ukraine. They reduced entirely the dependence on the Kremlin for gas imports. They overhauled the banking system, shutting down scores of banks that were corrupt and bankrupt. They introduced reforms in government procurement, ProZoro, and again, you'll hear more about this later today, which removed a major source of corruption in the country. At the same time, there was consolidation politically of the country. The CIA wrote in the early mid-90s, to its discredit, a report that talked about the coming split of Ukraine into East and West. The, the differences between East and West and Ukraine should not be minimized, but they should also not be exaggerated. Of course, the country did not fall apart between East and West in the 90s. And I served in Ukraine from 2003 to 2006 and saw the split between East and West diminish. And anyone who knows what's happened in Ukraine as a result of the Euromaidan and past knows that the, the difference between East and West has become even less today. The real father of modern Ukrainian nationalism is Vladimir Putin. By conducting war against Ukraine, he has consolidated a sense of nationhood, which de very definitely does not look towards Moscow. That sense of nationhood is so great today that, as we heard discussed earlier today, but not completely, uh, there, there's in, the country is on the verge of having one national church recognized by global orthodoxy, another sign of consolidation of Ukraine's national consciousness. Let me give you an anecdote to underscore this. Uh, I never saw more Ukrainian flags in my life as when I returned to Ukraine in June of 2014. They were everywhere. And they weren't just in, in Kyiv, they weren't just in the West, they weren't just in Lviv. You go to Kharkiv, you go to uh, Dnipro, you see them there. You go to Odessa, you see them there. Um, president Kuchma, who was president of Ukraine from, what, 94 to 2003, told me when, when I saw him in the fall of 2014 that his grandson, who never identified as Ukrainian, he said this in the, in the fall of 2014, now is, highly, is proud to announce everywhere, and especially to his friends overseas, that he is Ukrainian. What I've just spoken of anecdotally is represented in political parties in the country. The party of the regions, which had a pro-Kremlin sympathy, has split into the rump party of the opposition bloc, and they represent a much smaller fraction of the Ukrainian population than they did um, five years ago. The country is very much on a westward course, exemplified by the fact that a large majority of Ukrainians want the relationship, membership in the EU, and a majority of Ukrainians even want to be part of NATO. And the reason why they want, we want to be part of NATO is because, as Volodymyr Habulin, Ukraine's greatest strategist, said to me, if we're not part of NATO, the Kremlin will feel it, it has the right to do whatever it wants in the country. So Ukraine needs to be part of NATO to stop Kremlin aggression. The point is very simple. 
The question that was asked in 2014, would Ukraine survive, has been answered in the striking affirmative. The country faces major problems, but it has consolidated. And there's no doubt in my mind that at some point within the next six to 10 years, hopefully well before that, the Kremlin will realize that his great adventure in Donbass has failed and Kremlin troops will withdraw. The thousands of Kremlin troops that are there today will be gone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Professor Haram will be our last speaker, as he has a PowerPoint for us, which is being loaded. Mm -hmm. So our second speaker will be Professor Borkowski. Uh, certainly can. <laughs> our second speaker from the reanimation <laughs> package of reforms, talking about uh, civil society and their efforts, will be Andre Boitson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the name of the session is Ukraine's Rebirth in the face of Putin's aggression, and I think uh, my role today is to discuss the reform agenda that Ukraine has, so actually the key reforms um, that are necessary in order to become a stronger state, rather than uh, talk about uh, dealing with Russian aggression directly. Um, I think um, it is very uh, important to understand that um, it is very important to understand that we are uh, still struggling with a number of fundamental reforms, and I don't think that without achieving major results on those fronts, uh, we can be a, a reborn state that is uh, that is effectively that is able to effect effectively deal with a foreign aggression. Now, um, the reanimation package of reforms. Um, and if you're interested, there are leaflets uh, at the entrance uh, in, in the hall, so you, you can see the reform agenda. But I will name a few key reforms that I believe um, belong here. First is uh, the anti-corruption reform. And obviously, the central body that needs to be created here is the, uh, uh, the anti-corruption court. Second, something that we do not often talk about uh, is the electoral reform. Um, I think that we have a system, political system that is far from perfect in the sense that we have a parliament, a unicameral parliament that is composed of two types of representatives. One of the type that gets selected um, uh, in the majority uh, uh, units and, and the others through the party list. The result is that Forming the coalition in the parliament is a, is a very, very fuzzy thing. And at the end of the day, we have very little accountability. And that is also coupled with the problem of the poor division of powers between the president and the prime minister or, or, or the cabinet. Um, the result being that we have a political system in which it is very difficult to get a decision adopted, to get something done, but it is very easy to get something stopped. Now, um, also, I think there will be a session later today on the energy sector. Um, I think this is a very crucial element in achieving um, a stronger state that is able to deal with Putin's aggression. And um, creating an energy market is the first thing that we should be talking about here. Um, f finally, um, there is a judicial reform. Um, I think that um, without having an effective judicial system, we cannot have a state that is able to invite, for, for example, a foreign direct investment. Um, uh, John Herbst mentioned that Ukraine declined uh, in 2013, uh, 2014, by 15%, the, the GDP, we have not yet returned to the level of 2013 since then. In order to do that, we need an inflow of investment. And in order to have the inflow of, of investment, we need to prov uh, provide security and assurance to the foreign investors that they will be getting their money back and that their investments are safe. And for that, the judicial reform, only for that, uh, is already a very, very important element. And then, of course, there is an entire economic reform agenda. Uh, personally, um, I specialize in corporate governance and uh, privatization. Um, I'm proud 
uh, to say that I developed the corporate governance reform for Naftagas in 2014. And I think um, that that reform is gaining momentum. For example, we, we have established supervisory boards in Ukrzaliznice, the national railway operator, uh, Ukrenergo, the national transmission system operator for electricity. And that is, that type of reform is a major way of fighting a corruption because it removes uh, the source of corruption. Even more efficient here was dealing with state property, a privatization. I don't think we have much to boast about today uh, on the privatization front, but uh, with privatizations, um, despite the fact that we have approaching elections, there is more momentum than there used to be two, than there was two years ago or so. So having this reform agenda in mind, very important uh, next year, because as we approach the double elections of 2019, we have the feeling that, and I don't think this is a, a Ukrainian phenomenon, that, uh, that the willingness for reform and the attention available to affect reforms is declining. But after the elections, when the new government will have a longer mandate, I think it is very important to start with the reforms that I have just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Our third speaker is Professor Ihor Burakovsky uh, from the Ukrainian Institute for Economic Research, where he is head of the board. Uh, Ihor and I first wrote a paper together in 1996 about uh, the state of Ukraine's economy and the necessary reforms. Uh, I don't know if that's a depressing thing or not, as it was 22 years ago, but uh, Ihor, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Could you help me with my presentation? Well, it should be on. on uh, okay, fine. It works. I just would like to say a few words about corruption in Ukraine, which is quite a popular topic, I would like to say. And well, from my point of view, it's very important actually to understand what was done, how it was done, and actually what should be done in the future. Why the corruption is important? Because simply, actually, corruption is a danger to Ukrainian sovereignty. The uh, corruption is a kind of um, barrier well, to Ukrainian economic performance. And of course, actually, corruption is something which prevents us from building uh, uh, working, working, democracy, working democracy in the country. This is a kind of general lecture. I'm going to, well, to stop at this particular point and to give you just a few, uh, a few figures and a few facts from our recent research. Here is a kind of well, corruption heritage. I think that everything is clear. What is inside, well, this is definitely, well, <laughs> definitely corruption. And if we take, if we take, well, well, the figures, so the figures are quite impressive. We've been losing money, well, in, uh, uh, in, different, in different ways from NAFTA gas activities. And actually, we lost a lot of things due to state capture, 10% of GDP in year 1990. 2013. We lost a lot of things in terms of uh, corruption in public procurement, lack of transparency, and a lot, a lot of other, uh, of other things. What I would like to say is that actually when we are talking, we are talking here only about well, the so-called well, political corruption. When the state institutions were captured either by oligarchs or corrupt politicians, and actually well, the country was successfully exploited well, to the benefit of the private interests to the benefit of the private interests. A lot of things were done, and I would like to say that definitely when we are talking about the corruption, we need to discriminate between two dimensions of this fight. One is, well, economic dimension. Well, this is about narrowing the scope for corruption, and this is exactly what our report is about. And the second one, of course, is punishment, legal actions, etc., etc., etc. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this particular point. I would like to simply well, to give you some facts about the changes in rule and their effects in terms of in terms of combating corruption. This is one and only slide what I'm very, really proud uh, again uh, 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 in general. Well, this is a kind of well, annualized benefits of anti-corruption anti fights in Ukraine. If we take actually the year for 2015 to 2017, 15, 16, and 17, three years, so actually you should memorize well, quite a, a comfortable figure. 6% of GDP, which is approximately uh, 6 billion US dollars on annual basis. This is the total result of the combat in corruption in different fields. In the field of NAFTA gas, tax administration, 
public procurement, open data. Well, that's about also, well, not only open data as such, but that's about uh, prov provision of administrative services and, well, opening with different types of uh, re registers, different types of lists, which were used as a kind of tool for corruption, and a lot of other things. Plus, transparency of governments and improvement of, uh, of business cl climate. But again, actually, I would like, well, to come from a kind of, you know, figures from the report, positive figures, well, to some, actually, well, uh, some thoughts which are very important. So number one, even with the above mentioned positive achievements, the fight against corruption has already started. What does it mean? That unfortunately, well, at the moment, we cannot say that we passed the point of no return in our corruption, in our corruption struggle. This is very important, and of course, actually, we need not only well, political consolidation, but we need a full-fledged support in terms of well, moving from combating political corruption to combat high-level corruption at the level of certain institutions, and of course, actually, to the petty corruption, which is plaguing the well, Ukrainian society fr from inside. Uh, we could go uh, actually uh, uh, through uh, specific issues where the corruption was more or less, uh, 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 more or less, uh, more or less limited. But I would like actually to draw attention to a couple to a couple of conclusions. Conclusion number one. Well, uh, uh, there is a number of risks, again, actually. Well, you know the perspective, perspective is quite sure. We need, well, to bring up, well, the population. We need, actually, well, to make Ukrainian society zero tolerant to, to, uh, to, uh, to corruption, which is quite a fundamental task. But when it comes, actually, to the risks, well, the risks are as follows. Risk number one, definitely, well, the slowdown of reforms. Slowdown of reforms means also, actually, well, the uh, slowdown of the reforms, well, in terms of combating corruption. Point number two, transformation of real fight against corruption into an instrument of unfair political and economic and economic competition. Unfortunately, on the eve of the presidential and parliamentary election, this is real. It's not only well about populism, it's not only about fake news from Russia, but it's about corruption, which could be used well by different political actors against each other. Point number three, lack of a comprehensive uh, strategic approach well, to fighting corruption. We have a lot of strategic documents, but these documents are to be coordinated. These documents are to be, so to speak, put on uh, a solid financial and institutional basis, which is fortunately well, not the strongest part of Ukrainian policy and so on. In general, Ukrainian actually is successful in overcoming political inherited corruption in the form of different vertically integrated schemes. But again, we need actually well to talk about well the first steps. Two more things, and I would like actually to stop at this point and would be ready well to answer your questions. Lack of sustainable political consensus about fighting corruption. This is a very big problem because it's not only about the kind of phenomenal you know, problems inside the governing elite, but it's also well uh, the problem for the Ukrainian. Uh, political spectrum. Different political parties have their own views. Sometimes, unfortunately, well, this views are biased in terms of how to combat corruption and what actually should be done in this particular field. Point number two, stakeholders' attempts actually to ensure political control over newly established corru anti-corruption bodies. From my point of view, actually, we need not only to talk about well, the political independence of Ukraine, the economic independence of producers, etc. We need to talk about well, political independence of anti-corruption bodies as in the way it was secured for the National Bank. National Bank is independent as a kind of money-making mechanism, and of course, anti-corruption bodies are to be are to be of this uh, are to be at this uh, are, are to be in the same are to be in the same shoes. And uh, final point is again, actually, well, uh, right now we saw a lot of attempts actually to combat corruption in different institutions, and of course, well, there is a kind of you know, well, uh, striking difference between the uh, news about well, the people who were arrested for some corruption deeds and the legal cases in the courts. That's something which society wants to see. Again, actually, well, we should understand that well, newly established anti-corruption bodies need some time to fine-tune their activities. But of course, actually, well, the expectations of Ukrainian society is quite high. What all this presentation and all this report shows First, actually, it showed that Ukraine has, to, uh, has been well extremely corrupted country, and only now we could understand the depths of the corruption, the depths of how well this corruption was deeply rooted well, in Ukrainian political and economic fabric. Point number two, the report and well, this presentation, my personal point, show that actually we could do a lot of things in terms of changing the rules, and we are doing well these rules in order well, to limit, to narrow the corruption space 
in, in economic terms. And actually, well, point number three, where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is Alexei Haran, who is both research director at the Democratic Initiatives Foundation and professor of politics at uh, Kiev Bohila Academy. Alexei. Yes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will be talking about the changes in public opinion of Ukrainians, which is actually the basis for political decision and decision makers. So actually, I believe that I should be number one on the program, on the list. But for technical reasons, I appeared the last one. And actually, this is very good because my colleagues were so disciplined <clears throat> that they saved a lot of time so I can demonstrate to you a lot of, a lot of slides. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, let, me, let me actually um, support some of the very important theses which Ambassador Herbs shared with us. Uh, let's talk about the changes uh, within political uh, identification of Ukrainians. And we put the choice for Ukrainians, asking the, uh, answering the question, whom you consider to be first and foremost. Number one is citizen of Ukraine. Number two is regional identity. And number three is citizen of the USSR. So citizen of the USSR definitely decreased dramatically. But what is really important? So people had to choose whom do, do they consider first and foremost, citizen of Ukraine or they have some regional or local identity. And you can see the dramatic changes which happened after the revolution of dignity and start of the Russian aggression. So most Ukrainians choose the option of citizen of Ukraine. And I would like to stress citizen of Ukraine, not ethnic Ukrainian. So this is also important to understand because sometimes we can hear uh, from Russia and from Western journalists about ethnic nationalism in Ukraine, the importance of the far right. Actually, they are marginalized, marginalized. And more people believe in Ukrainian political nation, which means that whatever is your ethnicity, whatever is your uh, language, if you consider yourself to be Ukrainian patriot and you are in favor of Ukrainian territorial integrity, you are a citizen of Ukraine. So the definition of political nation. Changes in the regions. Uh, the same changes are in the regions. Uh, the legend, unfortunately, is in Ukrainian. But you see the green. In green, this is again the choice citizen of Ukraine from the west to Donbass. Uh, we made our research on Ukrainian controlled Donbass. Unfortunately, we were not able to work in the occupied Donbass. So you see that most people, green, green color, they consider themselves, choose the option of being citizen of Ukraine in every region of Ukraine. Again, uh, we ask the question, are you proud or not proud of being citizen of Ukraine? And actually, Ukrainian appears to be wiser than they are depicted sometimes even in Ukrainian media and on Ukrainian television. Because we, we are a democratic country, we have freedom of media, unprecedented in time of war, and you have criticism of the government on every channel, including presidential channel. So everything is lost, everything is bad, but still Ukrainians are proud of being Ukrainian. And the number has increased since 2014. Again, you see these changes in every, in every region. Again, green. In green color, I am proud to be Ukrainian from the west to the east and Donbass. The number of people who, um, who have positive attitudes towards Russia decreased dramatically in Ukraine, in blue, in blue in Ukraine to Russia. So Ukrainians always had the feeling of being uh, friends with Russia, you no know, strategic partnership with Russia. But definitely what happened in, the, in 2014 undermined this approach. And my colleague coined the phrase that Putin got Crimea, but he lost Ukraine. The attitude towards union with Russia and Belarus. Red line is rather positive. So again, you see 
you see dramatic decline. Uh, there are regional differences. There are regional differences here, but anyway, most Ukrainians have negative attitude. In every region, they have negative attitude towards union with Russia and Belarus in blue. In blue, this is negative, negative attitude. In Donbass, you see it's, it's mixed, it's divided. It's divided. But still, in the most of the country and most of the regions, you have negative attitude. Security. As you know, supporters of NATO were always in minority in Ukraine. And after 2014, support for NATO skyrocketed. And basically, if you have the referendum right now, it would be won by supporters of NATO in landslide. However, here we have regional differences, and regional differences here are important because negative Ish, a negative attitude to NATO in blue. You see the negative attitude to NATO in East, South, and Donbass. So again, throughout the whole country, mostly support for NATO, but you have regional differences. Also, I would stress here that if you have 19% in Donbass who are supporting NATO, this is tremendous increase because before 2014 do you can you imagine what was support for NATO in Donbass any guess zero zero point two okay now it's 19 percent but you see here that attitudes to NATO still divide the country and that's why this is one of the re uh, reason why um, it's not a good idea to have referendum of, on NATO, on joining NATO. It's not actually demanded by Ukrainian constitution. So that's why uh, Ukrainian authorities decided to uh, formulate, to adopt it in the constitutional changes, the course for NATO and the EU. And the EU is supported. The EU is supported overwhelmingly. Now, let me briefly move into the topic of the next session. It's about Donbass and potential compromises in regarding Donbass. So we are asking people what do they prefer, or what do they consider to be uh, necessary to achieve peace. Military victory, minority, logical. 20% they believe in peace at any price. So basically, this is the base for Putin. The, they are ready to accept whatever Putin is demanding in order to have peace. We need to understand that people who are living in the East, close to the front line with shellings, with all the hardships, they think about peace. But most Ukrainians, 50, more than 50%, they believe that, yes, we are ready for compromises, but not all. And then an interesting question, because we tried to specify what specific compromises Ukrainians are ready to accept. And it appears, you see the column, not acceptable. Actually, most people consider all the compromises which are written in political part of the Minsk agreements as not acceptable. That's important for us to understand because Minsk agreements were signed under the barrel of the gun and there is security part which is favorable for Ukraine because it demands ceasefire, withdrawal of weapons, that's what we need and it's not in force yet. But uh, then comes political part which is not very favorable for, you, for Ukraine. So, and Ukrainians decline it. They do not accept it. That's why any idea, you know, to push for political compromises first before there is a real security in the East will be not acceptable to Ukraine. But Ukrainians, what they support, they support peacekeepers in the Donbass. And they support creation of UN transitional administration as the most effective way of solving the crisis. So the idea of peacekeepers is quite popular in Ukraine and uh, when Ukraine is trying to push it forward with support of our Western partners, it actually relies on the support from the people, from 
public opinion in Ukraine. And finally, what other compromises are possible? You see that Ukrainians, for example, in political part of Minsk agreements, there is a provision about full amnesty. Ukrainians don't buy it. So is there any potential for compromise? Yes, because Ukrainians are ready to accept partial amnesty for those who didn't commit serious, uh, serious crimes. And Ukrainians believe that in order to have uh, the process of amnesty, it's necessary to involve international experts and international judges. However, then the question, do you still believe that the process of amnesty would be fair? Most Ukrainians have doubts about that. So this is a really difficult topic. But compromises are possible. Are possible if, we are, uh, if there is a political will, but first, political will from the side of Putin. So we need to understand that Putin, perhaps he is not ready for compromises yet. He's trying to split the West. And he's waiting for results of the elections, Ukrainian elections. As it was pointed out, there's no chances for openly pro-Russian candidate to <coughs> win elections, in the, to win presidential elections. But then there, there are parliamentary elections. And here we have democracy, so we will have different parties in the parliament. And the new government would be formed according to the results of the new coalition in the parliament. And here Putin, definitely he hopes that some pro-Russian factions, some populist factions, they would increase presence in the parliament. So it would be easier to negotiate and to get concessions from Ukrainian uh, side. Uh, in general, my prediction is that elections, the result of elections, definitely do matter in Ukraine, but there would be no radical change. My prediction is that there would be continuation, whoever is elected, whoever is forming the government, but there would be continuation of the present course, which means moving forward in zigzag way, with problems, with contradictions, but still moving ahead and having um, difficult but necessary reforms. And you can imagine that on the eve of the elections, it's very difficult to conduct unpopular reforms. Finally, I would say, uh, because the issue of um, Ukrainian political system was raised by Andrei Boitsun, uh, it's a constant debate for Ukrainians what system to have and this is my last point. What system to have? Presidential system, a strong president, purely parliamentary system, as you have, or a mixed system. M most Ukrainians do not accept presidential system. We had this experience with Kuchma, with Yanukovych, and therefore there is a desire for strong hand in Ukraine to conduct necessary changes, to have anti-corruption uh, activity. But Ukrainians do not want to have authoritarian, authoritarian uh, leaders. So it means that we cannot conduct reforms in a authoritarian way as it was done, for example, by Saakashvili in Georgia. Regarding parliamentary system, unfortunately, political parties are not stable, not ideologically, programmatically oriented. They, in this sense, the system is fluid. And it means that purely parliamentary system would mean potential destabilization in the country, which would be used by Mr. Putin as well. So we shouldn't forget about this foreign uh, intervention and manipulation, the idea of destabilizing Ukraine. Therefore, it seems that in some form, uh, the best way would be a mixed system that we have right now, perhaps with some correlation. So we have government which is formed according to the results of election to the parliament. We have coalition in the parliament, like most, U most European uh, European countries do, but at the same time there is a president who can balance the, uh, the steps made by government or by the, by the parliament and who may push for some necessary 
uh, reforms and definitely who is responsible for foreign and security policy issues. Thank you very much. Fortunately, I'd seen an earlier version of Alexis' presentation, so I didn't have to twist my neck too much. Um, our speakers have been extremely disciplined. That leaves us plenty of time for Q&A from the floor. Uh, I think you will have the mic, yeah? Uh, and you, is that right? Excellent. Um, so in the unlikely event of your questions drying up, I have a few of my own, but I see, first of all, at the front, uh, Professor Aslan. And please identify yourselves. Anders Oslund, the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much for, an ex uh, for, for excellent uh, presentations. I'll focus on Igor uh, with regard uh, to corruption. And I would like to pose the question mm -hmm. to you uh, first. Ukrainians don't think that corruption has uh, declined, according to various opinion polls. How would you explain that? And uh, secondly, it appears to me that uh, the complaints uh, about corruption have changed nature. You touched a bit upon that. Uh, and it seems now that uh, it's mainly law enforcement, the prosecutor general's office and SPO, one less uh, the tax office. Could you elaborate a little bit about what people see as the main uh, thing? And the third suggestion that uh, perhaps uh, uh, some kind of corruption disappears and other forms of corruption uh, appears so that the change that just so, uh, showed very well the positive developments are not so striking but we are seeing for example more of monopoly pricing in various markets and uh, uh, less of uh, money le leading out of uh, public procurement and, uh, and NAFTA gas. Could you elaborate on uh, that question? Thank you. If you could collect your thoughts, I'll take mm -hmm. um, two or three questions uh, okay. in a bunch at once. I see Arisia at the front. If we can get a mic to the second row. Thank you very much, Arisia Lutsevich, Chatham House, Ukraine Forum. I have a question to Ambassador Herbst. Uh, you travel a lot, you know Ukraine quite well. When you look at Ukraine right now, before the upcoming elections, what do you think are Ukraine's main vulnerabilities in, in the internal system that Russia will play against Ukraine in the upcoming elections? And one question to Professor Harany. Um, I'm struggling with this paradox where we do see positive changes, but we also see Ukrainians saying that the country is moving in the wrong direction. How do you explain this? Thank you. Okay, we'll take those two. Ehod, if you could answer the question about <coughs> corruption first. Uh, Anders, thank you very much actually for the question and for your contribution well, to our report because I'm going to, well, to reveal one secret. secret. Uh, Anders was among the uh, international advisory board, the international editorial board of this report, so very grateful to him and well, our colleague. Well, question number one, well, definitely actually well, the uh, corruption has declined when we are talking about well, the so-called well, political corruption. But of course, actually, the people are not very much, uh, so to speak, uh, buying well at <laughs> this point, uh, simply because uh, when uh, you are asking, well, an ordinary Ukrainian, uh, well, uh, they are thinking in terms of petty corruption, that is everyday corruption, that's point number one. And point number two, actually, the more transparent Ukraine becomes, the more corruption cases will are revealed. And of course, actually, we have a kind of, you know, well, this, well, two parallel, two parallel processes. If something is done, maybe not very much efficient, not very much quick and comprehensive, as we would like to hear, but from the other side, definitely, the people want somebody to be crucified on Krishatik Street for corruption. A bad, actually, well, 12 people. 20 people will should be crucified well, on corrupt, uh, uh, for, for corruption for corruption allegation. This is uh, this is a kind of actually well my uh, my uh, my point. And of course, you also will need well, to take well, the time. In. The more actually we are approaching uh, presidential parliamentary elections, the more actually corruption points will become a kind of tool of different political technologies. It's also true. It's also true. So that's well, point number one. 
Point number two, actually, well, what about well, law enforcement? Well, definitely, actually, we have a lot of problems with the law enforcement. Currently, we have already established all the necessary institutions to combat corruption. So this is National Anti-Corruption Bureau. This is National Agency for Prevention Corruption. This is Anti-Corruption Court. This is Special Prosecutor General on Corruption Case, etc., etc. But so far, actually, well, they only will start the activities, and we do not see, actually, well, quite a, um, interesting statistics in terms of actually in terms of court cases and actually well uh, fines fines for the corruption so this is a problem and of course the people are demanding well that the, nobody should be not only immune from the corruption uh, allegation but also actually well they should be punished and of course the level of punishment is extremely low one in our report we show that actually well in year 2017 and at the beginning of year 2019 we have actually well, rare corruption cases uh, listening to the court, heading to the court, and actually, well, when it, uh, uh, when it, uh, when the people receive receive a certain punishment. So that's, of course, actually, well, the problem, and of course, well, the people are demanding a lot of things actually, well, to be changed. But from the other side, I would like to say, unfortunately, again, actually, when we are talking about about corruption, well, there is a kind of well, very interesting uh, public attitude towards corruption. They, at the top level, should not be corrupted. But when it comes to me personally, I could, you know, you know, some corruption, not actually well to grease the wheels of this state machinery, and that's also that's also well the problem. Currently within the business actually, well, we did a lot of studies in terms of business attitude. For example, well, recently well, we signed, well, I mean well, our institute and we signed an agreement with a, quite an interesting business association in Ukraine, well, the business for clean business. So it sounds a bit strange, but actually those people who are trying to comply with all the necessary customs procedures and they, they are trying actually you know, to reveal the cases of black, of smuggling actually of goods well, to Ukraine. So we see that actually well, there is also well, a kind of well, uh, fight against corruption, so to say, or at least actually, uh, well, non-tolerance to corruption from the side of the business. So the situation is very, well, I would like to say difficult, very complicated, but actually that's my, that's my short answer. And point number three, new, new forms of corruption. Of course, unfortunately, actually, Ukrainians are very creative people. So actually, well, when we uh, uh, design Prozora system, this is electronic public, uh, public procurement system, right now, actually, well, we see a lot of problems. We see a lot of problems, actually, in terms of uh, what are the relationship between the bidders before the information is fit into the system and actually afterwards. So this is a problem. So that's where right now actually we need, well, uh, this is my, so to speak, well, philosophical point. We need not only well, to protect those people who are fighting corruption, but also you know, well, to develop legislation and let us prevent the abuse of the non-corruption methods well, to, be, to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to be corrupted one. Again, actually, when we are coming to VAT, well, the uh, traditional problem for Ukraine, VAT reimbursement has been already well effectively solved well, from my point of view. No one is actually, well, um, quarreling that, well, there are some problems, but of course, actually, well, uh, uh, when it comes, actually, well, to the activities of the monopoly, well, that's another, so to speak, well, historic challenge. When we are talking about, well, the political and, so to say, well, independence, effectiveness of different institutions, actually, we saw quite an interesting political and economic cycle in Ukraine. It took us, well, approximately, well, 10 or 15 years to understand that the national bank should be completely politically independent. As a, as, a, as a divisor, as a kind of implementer of monetary policy. Right now, we did understand actually in Ukraine that all these institutions like National Anti-Corruption Bureau, etc., they also need to be politically, politically independent, actually to be ruled only by conscience and by the rule of law. Currently, actually, we are coming well to the third, third stage of apprehension. We need to understand that anti-monopoly committee Needs to, be, needs to be efficient, it needs to be very, it needs to be very, uh, very professional, and of course, actually, well, it needs well to, be, uh, to be, again, actually, well, politically, uh, politically, uh, politically independent. So we are talking about well, the developments of the institutions, and they think that actually, well, unfortunately, in small steps, in small, maybe, well, movements, but we are establishing as a kind of a system which, under certain circumstances, could be quite a good, actually, well, rule setter and also a kind of, you know, well, uh, uh, good policeman in terms of implementing, uh, uh, implementing anti-corruption measures. But again, actually, I would like to say that, well, I'm not, so to speak, well, uh, 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 making the picture in rose, uh, in rose stones. My point is, again, actually, well, Five, seven, and ten years ago, actually, during the Yalta European strategy, we were talking about how to make Ukraine to stop the reforms. 
And finally, actually, we started to do something. Right now, we need to talk how to uh, protect reforms, how to develop them, and actually how to make them, make them uh, socially, politically, and economically acceptable, not only for our Western partners, but for the Ukrainian population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Igor. Uh, the second question was both to um, Ambassador Herbst and to Professor Harrell. Okay, the question was about U Ukraine's vulnerabilities. Uh, I'd like to twist that question a little bit just to let you know that the Atlantic Council in partnership with the Pinchuk Foundation and also the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity is going to be doing a project to monitor Kremlin interference in Ukraine's presidential elections. And I'm mentioning this in response to the question because the Kremlin believes that by interfering in the elections, it can either destabilize the country or produce a, an election result, a new president, um, new uh, setup in the Rada, they will be more favorable to its interests as it defines it. Uh, a prospect, I think, that will fail. But Ukraine should be prepared for a multi-spectrum effort. One, massive use of Kremlin disinformation. Two, cyber operations, perhaps to actually get into the um, election servers, uh, but certainly in, in other ways to mess with the different candidates. They expect to see flows of money to their preferred candidates. We know that um, Mr. Putin's close Ukrainian ally, Viktor Medvedchuk, is working to unite the forces of the East. Uh, the party of Zajitya under Mr. Rabinovich and the opposition bloc. I think that will fail, but that's certainly the effort. Uh, we should expect a full range of Kremlin kinetic operations. That, of course, is, means escalating and de-escalating the Kremlin aggression in Donbass. Deployments on Ukraine's borders, both uh, on the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, as well as on the land borders, including with Belarus. Um, continuing pressure on Ukrainian shipping in the Sea of Azov. Over 150 ships have been stopped by Russian naval forces since April. Um, we should not rule out possible assassinations, including spectacular assassinations. And efforts, as we've seen in the past, by the Kremlin to subvert parts of the country, as in the efforts, the failed efforts in the spring of 2015 to create an Odessa and a Bessarabian People's Republic. So all these are vulnerabilities that the Kremlin will target. And the project that I mentioned will be designed to talk about what the Kremlin is up to and how Ukraine, and for that matter, the United States, the EU, NATO can respond to Kremlin aggression. Uh, there's one more point that I need to bring up, which goes beyond the nasty activities uh, coming from Moscow. Ultimately, the main vulnerability Ukraine has is um, overly ambitious politicians who define the national good as their own personal good. Uh, now, this is not a problem unique to Ukraine. Um, all countries suffer from it, but not all countries are under attack by the world's second largest military power. Thank you, Must. Alexei. Um. Ukrainians, Ukrainians are always very critical and dissatisfied with any government. Uh, it, sh it was shown throughout all the history of Ukraine, Ukrainians, modern Ukraine, Ukrainians are dissatisfied with the government, with very short exceptions after Maidan first and Maidan two. I would say <coughs> that, how, however, however, um, when we are asking Ukrainians about the prevailing dominating feeling that they have, it appears, and that was a real surprise for me, that they have hope. Hope is feeling number one. So this is very important. So Ukrainians are dissatisfied, but they have hope, and they are proud, as was shown here, uh, to be Ukrainian citizens, citizen, and it gives some hope, actually, for the future of Ukraine. And, but in general, if you analyze the feelings of Ukrainians, they're very mixed very contradictory and ambivalent. Definitely there are economic hardships, uh, so it influences uh, attitudes of uh, Ukrainians towards the government. And actually one of the danger is that it creates possibility for increasing populism from many candidates in the election 
campaign. Uh, I would also like to refer to the issue of corruption. We did surveys on corruption. So if you ask Ukrainians what they think about anti-corruption reform, most Ukrainians would say it failed. At the same time, we are asking Ukrainians, are you personally uh, giving bribes during, or have you given bribes during the last year? And it appears that the number of people decreased significantly. And actually, minority of Ukrainians were giving bribes. So one thing is the reality of the corruption. And I believe, even from my personal experience, actually, that the corruption in general decreased in Ukraine. The other thing is perception about corruption, which is measured, by the way, by Transparency, Transparency International. 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 Uh, because we are discussing, debating corruption, again, everywhere, on every forum, on every talk show, on TV, there is a perception of increasing, public perception of increasing corruption. While in reality, as was shown by Professor Burakovsky, it decreased. Yeah. A quick comment from Andrei Boitson, and then I'll take another round of questions. Yeah, I just want to add to what uh, Professor Haran just said, um, to refer to Andrei's uh, question. Uh, if the question that we are asking uh, is, has it become better? Uh, the answer is probably yes, from what I hear from Professor Borokovsky's presentation, because uh, VAT reimbursement, nafta gas, loopholes, uh, Prozoro, those things have decreased the potential on the one hand. But uh, on the other hand, what is the reference point when we are asking that question? Has it become better or has it become what we had hoped it would become? So that hope that uh, Professor Haran is talking, talking about is still there. I think the mismatch between the original expectations and uh, the pace of change is not satisfactory to most of the respondents. So that is, I think, the explanation to, to the results. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll take another round of questions. Uh, there's a gentleman here, if you still have a question, uh, followed by the gentleman in row three. And I have a question, so that'll be three. Uh, here at the front, a uh, gentleman in the black suit. Uh, Tom McCain, uh, an associate of the Institute. I've got one, one uh, comment and a couple of questions which uh, are addressed to Professor Haran. Um, it sounded to me as though the uh, the type of compromises that uh, respondents uh, were able to uh, imagine being able to make uh, were rather modest compared to what might be required to uh, reconcile uh, everybody in the country. I'd be interested in your comment on that. Um, and the two questions are, um, one, uh, have you uh, made any attempt to estimate how the figures would have changed had you been able to poll in the areas that were outside the government's control. And secondly, uh, on the question of uh, neutrality and NATO, I was struck by the fact that there's a relatively high score for uh, uh, joining NATO, 55-60% I think was the, the figure on your slide. Um, but at the same time, when you posed the question about neutrality, uh, the results were more ambiv ambivalent, with 31%, I think, in favor of neutrality, um, and 40% uh, opposed. Thank you. Uh, second question, uh, gentleman in row three, just there. Thank you. Um, thank you to our um, panelists, Yuri Bender from the um, FT group, I would like to ask um, again um, to Professor Oleksii Haran a um, slightly similar topic to, to the previous questioner. Um, you've talked a lot about Ukrainian identity in the government-controlled territory. What about the identity in the occupied territory in Donbass? Um, can, what can the Ukrainian government do to strengthen that identity in terms of making it easier for citizens to come and go across the contact line to 
collect their pensions? Um, can we present them with a strategy, a vision of what life will be like after reintegration of Donbass? The people I speak to in the occupied territory, they say very much, um, Russia doesn't want us, Ukraine doesn't want us, we have no future. They don't feel like citizens of, of Ukraine anymore. Mainly for you, Alex. <laughs> now? We are not collecting anymore? I don't see any other hands. Any, anybody else would like to add a question? Hopefully not for me. So I can... Adrian, <laughs> hidden behind the dais. This will be probably for both Mr. Boitsun and uh, for uh, uh, Alexei Haran. Um, Timofey Milovanov, who is a, uh, an economist also teaching in Pittsburgh as well as in Ukraine, conducted a study of the long-term long voting patterns of what are called the Euro-optimists, the f collection of about 40 or 45 reformers who emerged within varying political parties. But they're, they're split up among various political parties. And his study found that over time, they regressed and voted more and more frequently with their party than at the beginning of their tenure. In other words, there was a trend toward establishmentarianism. If the party was moving in a more populist direction, they kind of were drawing along. If the party was more uh, establishmentarian, they went in that direction. So my question is, there is no, apart from the IMF, which is, I guess, the liberal reformist party inside Ukraine, there is no indigenous political force which coalesces people who are by principle and ideas uh, as a f governing philosophy committed uh, to fundamental reforms. What are the chances that something like that will happen? And does Ukraine need something like that to move reforms from within as much as from without. Thank you. Alex. Okay, let me start uh, with the last que let me start with the last question. Um, <clears throat> Adrian, yes, you are right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those whom we call liberal reformers or Euro optimists or younger generation of politicians, they are not in one political force. They are in, you, you can find them actually in every political faction and sometimes they try to cooperate to have a single voice. But uh, yes, they are now with different political political forces, and uh, it will be vividly demonstrated during election campaign. Um, it's actually the problem for Ukraine that a real liberal um, reformist party didn't emerge. There are several. There are several. Actually, there are many groups, many political small parties. But they are competing with each other, and uh, at this point, they do not have a chance to push for a single candidate in the campaign, which would have realistic chances. So perhaps they may have better chances in the parliamentary campaign, but again, for that, they need, uh, they need unity, they need a unified political force, and unfortunately, here we are coming to ambitions of uh, politicians, not only of older generation, but also of the younger generation. So uh, my focus, there will be no real uh, liberal reformist candidate in the campaign, new one, I mean, uh, with chances to be, even to come to the second round, but there could be some changes, uh, some chances for parliamentary campaign. Uh, will answer? Will continue the answer to this yeah, question? No. Uh, no. No. Okay. Yeah? Yes. And then we will proceed with. And then there's a question. Again. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, to get back to your uh, uh, question on Euro optimism, um, I think the pace of um, reform in general has slowed down if you compare it to what it was four years ago. So if that correlates with the voting patterns that you have just described, that would not be surprising. Um, also. I think you know as well as I do that in some of the parties they have no choice. So if the party boss says it should be voted this way, they do do it this way. It doesn't matter whether you're optimists or you're, you're skepticists. So I think they, in some of the factions they will have stronger discipline than in others. And that tells when uh, 
uh, when the pace of reform declines. And yes, I agree with you that there is not yet an indigenous force that has a, a, a liberal uh, reform agenda. Um, so far, besides the external pressure, this role has been fulfilled by the representatives of the civil society, such as the reanimation package of reforms, but I too think that there is room for a strong party based on liberal values. Well, regarding, regarding compromises and uh, attitude to NATO, again, as I have said, uh, Ukrainians reject the compromises as they are formulated in Minsk agreements, because it looks like aggressor occupied part of the country, and then he demands autonomy for this part, and we are asking Ukrainians, are you ready for that? Do you accept it? And definitely people would say no. Okay? However, if you formulate it a bit different, for example, do you think that these uh, measures would be helpful to move to peace? There would be a different, a bit different uh, yeah, structure of, of the answers. So, for example, regarding NATO, there's no contradiction. So, yeah, if you ask people, if you're asking people, are you in favor of joining NATO? They would say yes. But there could be another survey, which we did, and we were asking, are you ready for compromises to reach peace? So do you think that non-bloc status would be more helpful to reach peace? And here the numbers would decrease, so more people would, uh, uh, would consider that it's possible to negotiate on that with Putin in order to reach a peaceful solution. But again, majority would decline. So there's no contradiction here. Regarding the polls in the occupied territories, unfortunately, there are limits to that, to conducting polls there. To the best of my knowledge, uh, there was one uh, phone, uh, phone um, polling, which was done by German center Zeus. Uh, and there were pollings, one phone poll, polling in Lugansk and the region and face-to-face -face interviews in Donetsk, which were conducted uh, by uh, United, United Nations agency. Uh, again, the results, are, the results are mixed. Definitely one trend is separation of people from, from Ukraine, and this is natural. You have war, you have Russian propaganda there, you have occupations, so it's not surprising. Um, if we are analyzing anecdotal um, data, uh, then you'll find still that in the occupied territories there are people with clearly pro-Russian views. They are there, they are vocal, definitely. There are people with pro-Ukrainian views. And it was shown, again, surprisingly, by the phone poll which was done by uh, Tsois. The result were extremely optimistic. 55% would, be be, would like to be with Ukraine in the future. For me, it's even too optimistic result. So I would not rely fully on that, but there, is, there are pro-Ukrainian views there as well. But majority would be the swamp. So people care about peace, they need, uh, they need peace. What to do in order to, um, to make these people closer to Ukraine? Definitely there should be measures, uh, measures to, um, to preserve ties that there are between Ukrainian controlled areas and non-controlled areas, but it's difficult. It's difficult uh, because there are provocations, there are provocations from the other side, and also there is a pressure in Ukraine. For example, I will give you uh, the example that before the so-called blockade was introduced uh, in February, March last year, um, the type of relations between Ukrainian government controlled areas and the occupied areas could resemble what we had in relations between Moldova and Transnistria. So there were economic ties, limited, but there were economic ties. But in Ukraine, there was strong criticism about that. 
and the government was accused of building business on blood. This popular expression, business on blood. So there were protests. And at the end of the day, uh, the government had to react to that and to change the policy and to announce formal blockade, which for me wasn't a very good step, right? Because it creates more difficulties in personal intercommunication between people, but still there was a public pressure on the government and the government had to react to that. Still, so formally we have a blockade, but in reality, we need to understand that every day 30,000 people are crossing the line, 30,000, every day, which is a huge work for agencies of Mr. Gritsak, and I believe he will elaborate on that, on that further. Uh, and they are coming to Ukraine, bringing also then goods to the occupied areas. So while we are talking about blockade, we need to understand that this is not full blockade in the in the real sense of this word. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Do we still have two half And if there are further questions, I'm sure they are. <laughs> All topics exhausted? <clears throat> I had one question. Um, you it seemed, yeah, for soul. yeah. Um, kind of implicit in a lot of what has been said. Um, certainly from your data, Alexei, uh, it was pretty clear that real revanche, an actual swim of the pendulum of public opinion, it is pretty unlikely. So, but a lot of the kind of things we've been hinting at are really soft revanche. Uh, and looking at um, political posters in Kiev a couple of weeks ago, not a very scientific way of experimenting things, but there seems to be a lot of creativity at the wrong end of the spectrum. Right? So you have all these successor parties to the opposition bloc talking about peace, compromise, playing on this kind of soft revanche. Uh, and there are objective factors there. One is political culture that you've hinted at. Ukrainians are always against the government. There's a kind of cyclical negativity in every election cycle. And the other is that although we have, uh, in some respects, a securitization of public opinion, uh, your data also shows that people put pocketbook issues right near the top. Day-to-day um, -to -day stuff, prices, standard of living, whatever, where there's been relatively little progress. And those are the things that uh, the populists <laughs> can play. Uh, sort of war fatigue. They don't say peace with Russia. You know, you, you use these code words like compromise as a, so a soft revanche is possible if not a hard one. Andrew, thank you so much. Actually, I may save time for coffee break and say, yes, you're, you're right. <laughs> 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 but, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, what is on agenda of Ukrainians? Number one is war and peace. Number two, social economic issues, number three, corruption. So these are the topics that would be exploited to the full extent in the electoral campaign and which gives a lot of possibilities for populists from different sides, not only of, from pro-Russian side, former part of region, but also from the forces which call themselves to be nationally oriented, national democratic, and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, this is the reality. Uh, what else? Uh, does it mean <clears throat> revenge? And you are right that you uh, delineating between revenge and soft revenge. Uh, again, this soft revenge is possible if, say, pro-Russian forces, which are affiliated now with post-Yanukovych forces, will be successful in the parliamentary elections. Although I don't think they would be able to form a majority in the parliament, but their influence could be increased. This is reality. However, uh, we should remember that parliamentary elections will come after presidential elections, and a lot would depend who will be the winner, because definitely the winner will have uh, a lot of advantages in the 
parliamentary campaign. And here I wouldn't talk about uh, soft, even soft revenge, because I believe the opinion in Ukraine, public opinion, changed dramatically, and now it's really toxic. It's, it's popular to talk about peace. Everybody is in favor of peace, right? But again, the, here comes the question at what price. But it's very toxic now to talk about uh, relations with Russia, say, strategic partner relation with Russia. It's toxic for all the forces, with the exception of uh, post-Yanukovych forces. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, would anybody like to make a closing statement or remark? Anything been left in the air? In that case, uh, I can ask you to thank all the panelists in the traditional fa fashion, and we can head for coffee. you that coffee will be served upstairs because we've been so much on time and so efficient and uh, orderly. Uh, we have a half hour and we'll reconvene at 11.50. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Burakovsky has kindly brought uh, 15 or so copies of uh, the report that is also on his website of the Institute of Economic uh, Research, but you're uh, free if you have uh, the interest uh, to read the more detailed findings in an English language report that I will leave uh, over here uh, at the front. And we can reconvene in half an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>